I'm Ann Rieselbach, the Architectural League's Program Director, and I'd like to welcome you to this month's FF Distance Edition, hosted by the Winnipeg design firm 5468796, and it's their zip code in case you wondered. Um, these programs reinvent the League's monthly studio-based First Fridays with online visits to design practices across North America that often include studio tours, site visits, and the opportunity to experience firsthand, albeit virtually, the surrounding physical and cultural context for their work. This year's series is focused on architecture practices to expand disciplinary boundaries by taking on multiple roles, including design advocacy, fabrication, research and community engagement, or all of the above, pretty much in the case of this firm. You can find videos of past FF studio visits along with a host of other content, of course, on the League's website. Upcoming programs in this series include next month's visit to Kennedy Viollich Architecture in Boston on Tuesday, March 2nd, followed by a lineup that includes Studio Gang, L.A. Moss, and a studio Rosanna Montiel. In addition to producing the program, we ask each firm to identify a program moderator who they think will have an affinity for the ideas underlying their work. Tonight's event will be introduced and moderated by Aaron Betsky, director of the School of Architecture and Design at Virginia Tech and a true polymath who in his own career is a prolific author, journalist and critic, as well as architect, curator and museum director among other things, has addressed critical architectural and cultural issues that span disciplinary boundaries. Following the presentation and Aaron's discussion with, with principals Johanna, Sasha and team members Colin and Ken, the discussion will be open to all attendees, at which point we hope you will turn, on, turn your cameras back on. We ask you to please turn them off during the presentation to make this feel as close to a real gathering as we can approximate by Zoom. You can pose your questions in the chat section and when possible, and if you feel comfortable doing so, we invite you to ask them in person when called on. Finally, information will be posted in the chat section for those CE seeking CEUs for attending this program because yes, indeed, you do qualify for one. And with that, I will pass it off to Aaron. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne. And just before anyone uh, calls the uh, accrediting board, uh, I am not actually an architect. I am trained as an architect. I am Sorry not about that. licensed. That's all right. It's amazing uh, how at an AIA event you can get yourself in trouble. Uh, good evening, welcome everyone, and welcome to our friends, especially from Winnipeg. Tonight's event is really going to touch the very borders of architecture, although what is interesting to me about the work and uh, their peculiar location is that it positions itself also very much at the core uh, even I might add a kind of norm core, uh, though a norm core that has been perversely refined. Winnipeg, after all, is that kind of a place. It is a perfectly normal suburban, heavy um, North American city with about 800,000 inhabitants and a few more if you include the outlying areas although there the outlying areas very quickly uh, turn into tundra, marshes, and the northern forests that lead up to uh, the very pole itself. Uh, it is a city that has a history of modernist architecture as these architects were uh, very careful to point out to me that has a series of recognizable monuments that has tied those monuments to a series of boom and bust movements like many other cities. And that has developed uh, the same kind of hole in the donut, both in terms of the lack of building around the immediate urban core and in terms of a lack of architecture addressing that particular area between the very small for the very rich and the very large, probably also for the very rich. The design of not only social housing, but small scale multi-unit housing, uh, and in the case of this firm, even refugee housing, 
but also small scale commercial and the kind of structures that bind us to each other through the outfitting and stage setting of public space, which has become a particular focus of this firm. It is in that particular middle, both in terms of location and in terms of projects, in which five, four, six, eight, seven, nine, six, or as I like to think of them, the count to 10 firm, uh, like to position themselves. However, let's not make any excuses. They are way out there. The closest I've ever come to Winnipeg is being surprised when I was flying over the pole from New York to Asia and seeing what was obviously a large city when I thought we were already in the Arctic regions. Winnipeg is 800 miles from Minneapolis, the nearest city, and over 1300 miles from Calgary, the nearest Canadian city. It is, uh, touts itself as existing at the confluence of two great rivers, which makes it sound very romantic, until you realize that those are rivers that are the outlets of the Hudson Bay and ultimately of the Arctic Sea beyond it. It is out there in all kinds of ways, despite all its normalcy or despite being out there, it still seems to present itself, at least to us outsiders, with a degree of normalcy that however, again, uh, has in the case of this firm to be nuanced by the actual nature of the people who started it. They are refugees or at least expatriates, both of them. Johanna Hume, Hume came to Winnipeg and the University of Manitoba as an exchange student from Finland. And Sasha Radulovic came there as a war refugee from Sarajevo in Bosnia. Later, they were joined by the only one of the original partners who has, I guess, at least on paper, a semblance of normalcy, and that's Colin Neufeld. These uh, people together started a firm in Winnipeg in 2007, and I would guess, oh, even drinking some wine already, uh, even as a way to make them feel as if they were in a real place, gave it in fact the title of their zip code. However, it is a firm that in addressing the missing uh, middle, likes as one critic to, uh, uh, has put it, likes to quote, address the organ, or, organimis, oh God, I practice this and I still can get it, organismic bent for eccentric surprises with an avant-garde touch. Now, if that is not going to, if that does not promise a weird firm that designs everything from housing projects that look like satellites to migrating landscapes, warming huts and cubes that actually turned out to be amorphous structures in public space in a city where it's 30 degrees above zero in the summer and 30 degrees below in the winter, I don't know with what does. I can't wait to hear more about this utterly normal and utterly out there firm, 5468796, the word is to you. Thank you so much, Aaron, for setting the stage and appreciate it very much. Um, my name is Johanna. I'm uh, here with my colleagues, obviously, as you mentioned. And before we get going, I just wanted to give a little bit of context, but Aaron's done a good job. Um, I will add that we're on the center of, or we're in the center of um, geographic center of the North American continent. So, um, you know, but regardless, as you mentioned, um, we are very isolated and that has good things and bad things. Uh, it breeds innovation, we think. And we are a slow growth city, about 750,000 people. And we benefited from that, um, not having the boom and bust so much, but, um, um, but you know, going through these cycles where architecture matters and then not again. Um, and oftentimes, of course, looking from the outside, especially you wonder why people would be practicing architecture in Winnipeg. But to us, it's, it's really found 
um, we found it to be an extremely um, intriguing and important place to be for the fact that we have a really short um, feedback loop here. Um, so when we do something, it gets discussed and criticized um, in a way that helps us be critical about what we do. Um, we did talk about the temperature as well. So it is an extreme climate. Um, we get that uh, plus 40 to minus 40 Celsius, which is about 100 Fahrenheit and minus 40 Fahrenheit for those of you in the, in the US. Mm -hmm. Oops. It's not switching quite at the speed that I'm speaking. So I will try to keep pace with what we see on the screen. Um, so we've been operating since 2007 and uh, that makes us about 14 years old, almost 14 years old. And our goal was to really start to shake up the establishment that eliminated architecture at that time or previ previous to our start from the collective cultural radar and trying to build that back up. So that was sort of conscious and, and something that we aimed to do, but we really didn't have much of another plan um, other than really just wanting to work as a, as a collective. So originally um, it was the two of us and then Colin joined a year later. By the, by the end of the first year, we, um, we were up to, I think 10 people. So it was really fast in that sense that when we had a collective, we've always worked around a single table and that's really important to us. Uh, we wanna share information. It's, it's important for us to be open and, and appreciate everybody's ideas, doesn't matter what their, what their background. So having us as spokespeople here really just means that we're speaking on behalf of all of these people who have come and gone um, and maybe are still here, but have influenced us along the way. And uh, we continue to sort of update this, this uh, diagram as we, as we go along. But our presentation today is, is really consisting of two major parts. I'm gonna cover the first one and then Sasha's gonna get into the second one. And this is what we call the practice ecosystem. So I'm gonna talk about everything that's not the traditional permission of an architect, and then we'll move on to those more traditional permissions and, and the newest projects that we've been working on that we're excited about. So in essence, this ecosystem consists of uh, collaborations, um, competitions, juries, design, giving academic pursuits, exhibitions, writing, uh, thought leadership, political pursuits, awards, publications, of course, that everybody does. Um, huge part is the design activism um, and all of those um, in addition to practice are enabled by what we would think is financial success or has to be enabled by financial success. So that's also something that we're going to touch on briefly um, and oftentimes it's frowned upon what we think it enables everything that we do. So um, first of all, uh, from the conception of the firm, we've been focusing on, on heavily on the missing middle. Um, building housing for the 99%. Um, we didn't choose it, it just sort of came to us. Uh, we, our clients were developers heavily in the, in the beginning. They taught us a lot of things that if the bottom dollar doesn't, um, doesn't make sense, then we don't have a job and we don't have clients. So that's affected the way that we approach architecture and the way that we carve room for, uh, for the practice to occur. And again, more on the actual projects um, later. We started very local. Uh, most of our projects were here in Winnipeg. Um, and now, again, seems very local probably to the US audience there, but we're now operating across Canada from uh, Victoria, Calgary, Edmonton, uh, Saskatoon, Regina, and um, a little bit of doubles in the Toronto and, and potentially the Atlantic provinces coming up. Um, Competitions are an important part of what we do beyond the practice. It keeps us, um, it keeps us um, up to date with what's going on in the world and we hopefully can measure ourselves against. Um, we also pursue awards and publications shamelessly uh, because it does give us opportunities uh, and exposure for new clients and we've actually gotten clients this way. Um, similarly, we do speaking for the same reason and one of our biggest clients round square from from Calgary um, came as a result of a presentation and then contacted us on, us on Instagram. And so it's been a sort of a curious uh, path um, to, to finding new client, uh, clients. We also um, participate in juries. We, um, we try to get published again for those reasons that, um, um, that actually produce real work. Um, we uh, have pursued exhibitions, but again, um, different. Uh, this was the representation of Canada in 2012 at the Venice Biennale in collaboration with Jason Chong. 
Um, but in the end, when we look back on it again, it wasn't necessarily about the final product and the quality of the exhibition, but it was really about the process that got us there. We um, got uh, all of the young or big number of young architects across Canada involved. We traveled through seven, eight cities um, in Canada before we went to Venice and figured a new finance model for the representation at the, at the Biennale. Um, for some reason, I am stuck. Oops, um, we, uh, we've also exhibited our build details in a, in a build exhibition um, in a couple of places. And this is something that's supposed to become um, a traveling um, exhibition, um, trying to question what's, what's the norm and what's the standard and how we produce off the shelf um, or cheaper than off the shelf um, details um, in a custom format. Um, lots of participation in different uh, design festivals and so on. Um, and then all of that really says that what we're trying to do is we're trying to build architectural culture together with our colleagues here in Winnipeg that have really sort of with us taken, uh, taken Winnipeg on a bit of a renaissance, we hope. Um, and again, there's a new boom that many firms are participating in, so it's not just us, but um, but anything from uh, sessions called on the boards that invited um, architects in our city in a studio kind of a setting to discuss their ongoing work. And then we would crit critique one another doing a fringe festival in architecture alongside with our national advocacy organizations festival, um, you know, warming huts on the river, you'll hear more about later, uh, spearhead spearheaded by Peter Hargraves, our colleague. Um, and hosting Winnipeg Architecture Foundation, um, or not hosting, but um, uh, sharing space with them so that we would have a storefront in our, in our office and have a bit more of a street presence. Um, in that vein, design activism um, is something that we've been, we've been doing many forms. Um, one of the bigger projects that we undertook in 2013 as a result of uh, winning the Rome Prize for, for Canada, the Professional Rome Prize was Table for 12, um, which was uh, eight dinners around the world, uh, trying to figure out what builds architecture culture, who sustains it, who, who uh, spearheads it, and, and what could we take home uh, to Winnipeg and to Canada to, to learn from. And so we toured all of these cities and had the good fortune, of course, sitting now with Anne and others um, in New York uh, to learn the lessons that they, um, they sort of shared with us over dinner and, and drinks. And then that in collaboration again with, uh, with Storefront Manitoba, similar organization to Storefront uh, um, New York, of course, um, we, uh, we invented something called Table for 1200 in 2014 at the conclusion of that Table for 12 project and invited 1200 uh, Winnipeggers to sit around a continuous table, um, having dinner and discussing design. And now this has become an annual event for storefront for, um, for fundraising purposes. Um, so proud of that initiative at the time. Um, in 2000, and when was this? 15, something called Cherry Idea, which was a design a competition for ordinary Winnipeggers, ordinary citizens, in a sense that they could tweet, do a tweet long idea of what you could do for $30,000 and then for an entry five of $25, write their idea on a, on a chair that got distributed to participate in businesses. So we would have more seating um, um, in the public realm and claim that space back and discuss design ideas. In the end, the mayor uh, got a list of design ideas that he could do for, for pocket change, I guess, when it comes to city budgets. Um, so again, I'm a bit stuck here. Uh, the next project I wanted to share was uh, uh, something called uh, One Bucket at the Time. This started with, in collaboration with, um, with our Mexican uh, collaborators, Gerardo, Gerardo Fermin. and Fermin, um, in uh, Mexico City, who invited us to do a project um, in, uh, in, for um, Mextropoli, one of the bigger um, the world's biggest architectural festivals um, in, Mexico City. in Mexico City. And um, what the idea was based on the ordinary paint bucket that gets claimed by um, a Viene Viene who are, um, who are sort of entrepreneurs that claim public space for parking and then charge for it. And so this was another way that we would use the same ordinary bucket to reclaim back that public space. 
And what was really uh, close to our hearts about this is that we brought it back to, to Winnipeg, to Winnipeg Design Festival um, a, a year later, and then ended up um, selling the bucket, so to speak, to, to locals to raise money um, so that we could send money back to um, a Mexican girls orphanage um, to get street kids off the street and, and help them uh, start a new life. So that's been meaningful and something that we feel that we have a social responsibility to as architects to contribute back. Just checking. Um, <laughs> we've also started something called Design Port of Winnipeg in 2017. And so this was really just a kind of a business plan or a collective uh, marketing plan for local um, makers and creators. And uh, it was identifying that we actually have similar to where the inspiration came from was uh, Design District Helsinki and many other districts around the world where there's a concentration of design people. And uh, we had about 60 already that we would off the top of our heads um, come up with and, and made a business plan, collected the startup money um, and then started Leonard this campaign of sharing maps. Hmm? Leonard Lutzlayer. I know. So anyway, um, that's still operating today. Um, although I have to say that the pandemic has certainly put a, a um, dint on, on how well we can operate at the moment. Uh, hopefully we'll pick up back up when we, uh, when we move forward from this extraordinary time. So speaking of business plans, then I, I mentioned that financial success and I just wanna to touch on it. Um, we're not gonna share our books with you today, but uh, I wanna just, uh, iterate that uh, to our office, to the table that we, uh, we work around. 100% of our finances are, are uh, transparent. And uh, a few years back, seven years now, uh, we've, uh, we've invented something called the incentive program. And basically what it does is that if we, uh, we're held accountable by our group here, our team members, and they share in a pool, um, you know, a certain amount of money above a, a, a basic profit margin. And so if they meet that target as a collective, we meet it together, then they get a big chunk of uh, change to take home at the end of the day too. So that it sort of encourages us to all think uh, as a team, as a work as a team and make sure that our people are uh, reasonably paid and compensated for the for all of the special skills that they, they have in the world. And, and somehow that whole idea that we should be paying fairly to people, we should not be undercutting them is something that's sort of embedded into our thinking. And I, I you know, these are some of the things that um, have happened over the years. I have the 2019 outcome here, but it's really important that then, you know, um, while we hopefully have um, competitive salaries anyway, but then, then also, you know, people can, can share in the financial success of the firm. And it, again, it enables many things, which I'll speak to a bit more here. Um, so we also pursue a, to having a better workplace. So a few years back, we polled the, polled the office staff, um, the team members here to say like, what is actually important to you? Like, what are the things, initiatives that we should invest in and trying to think about if there's a way to make them work. And they were each tasked with one of these things, trying to think of how it makes sense for the firm as a business and how it makes sense for the for the people. Um, I, was, I was tasked to do the food. Yeah, so the food is the only thing that didn't happen or didn't get buy-in, uh, but we were inspired. I think some of the Danish firms that have food sharing programs in their um, in their roster, and uh, we're still working on the sabbatical. It's been launched, but unfortunately, because travel is not possible this year, uh, we've been sort of cut. Uh, um, well, short waiting, Colin's first wait, waiting to go on sabbatical and it's been delayed. So anyway, um, all of these things are important. Um, again, we want people to have lives beyond uh, architecture so they can come back to the workplace and be richer um, as a result of that. Um, in 2014, 18, I was sitting on the MAA, um, um, which is Management okay. Association of Architects um, Council and was uh, attempting to head a, a procurement task force there that was promoting the quality-based selection. Um, again, many states uh, in the US have this for, for public work anyway. I think it was 50, 50 states of the 52 or something um, use uh, quality-based selection for public um, commissions, but it's not the case in Canada and we're still fighting for sort of the fair share. And interestingly enough, this is not just 
for architects to pocket more money, as it may seem to, if there's any clients or developers out there or uh, people in the, on the client sector. But really, it's about creating better uh, better outcomes, uh, not only in, in terms of the cost of construction, but in terms of long-term viability and maintenance costs of projects. So it really results in that. And so it's an ongoing battle and, and we'll keep doing it because we believe that we have a civic and uh, social and, and uh, responsibility of the profession um, to make sure that um, it is not undercut and people are valued for their contributions. So sort of, I guess in a similar we count this under political pursuit, but uh, I was um, uh, fortunate enough to be invited to be um, a, a chair of the board of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce in 2017, 2018. And as part of that, um, spearheaded a sort of three minute discussion, three minute presentation campaign called Food for Thought um, at the monthly luncheons for the thousand plus business um, community members. Um, each month and so it became part of that those presentation or the you know the monthly luncheons and try to in there put in um i guess monetary or financial terms what makes sense to build a better more equitable more um sustainable and um you know following smarter urban principles or design principles city and so it's about trying to argue that um you know, there's a better return on investment for, for many of the things that, you know, creating walkable cities or, um, or investing into um, infrastructure other than, than cars. Um, and, you know, it could even save you from a divorce if you um, commute is, is shorter. And given the fact that we are... Um, we Saving are, the world. <laughs> well, that's right. One project at a time, but... Uh, sorry, I don't know if you heard Colin's comment. Anyway. Um, uh, now you lost the, I lost my point. Oh, so anyway, um, I guess the, the, the really this is to say that Winnipeg is one of those cities, as, as Aaron mentioned, that's hollowed from the center. And when we look at this compared to the density of Paris, Winnipeg could fit in like a, a fraction of its footprint. And, and we're constantly suffering from that. As a city, we invest so much money into something that everything that's tied into distance and so we would be so much better off we would design compact and, and many studies in the world show that and so trying to make the business case for that um, we also try to make it through housing we look at you know uh, the global assets that are put into real estate and and try to argue our way into smaller units and better design um, social housing it should have a bigger share of our total and as a result of this whole year um, at the at the head of the um, chamber of commerce we uh, were able to invite young Gail here to kind of beef up that message and and, um, and speak to that business crowd to a sold out room. And it was really quite a, an amazing event and, and a good conclusion to that, that year. Um, it also generated um, a chapter in a book called Innovative Solutions for Creating Sustainable Cities, uh, edited by Sylvie Albert. And currently Colin is just in the middle of uh, working in collaboration with Sharon Wool, one of our former members um, on uh, also uh, doing a chapter, I guess, Colin, um, yeah. for Future Urban Habitation, um, a publication on, on housing, um, editor uh, Oliver Heckman from Germany. And um, again, different design activism initiatives. This one is more sort of tied to real estate. Um, we do own a building in around the smack of our, our, our city here in the, in the sort of warehouse district and uh, negotiated a couple years ago with the city to try to house some of their uh, rather unsightly uh, storage boxes in a new way. Um, so building a new facade to our building, but then also housing their storage um, in the same thing. But really what was important there is that we, um, we convinced them or donated to them also having an extra container along that storage front that which have now has become the exchange biz districts um, Bijou uh, patio, so it houses a bar, and um, in the summertime that you can uh, also order local eats from around uh, the area to and, and sit around. Um, I'm not doing on time. I sure. should wrap up. Okay, uh, <laughs> there are initiatives like building an extra suite on top of one of the projects that Sasha will share with you and uh, trying to give back by inviting artists, uh, local artists, not local, but visiting artists or 
uh, pretty critics or, or what have you that need accommodation uh, in a fairly amazing location. I won't say more about that, but it's really important to us to be able to give back to the community, not just in our work, but also um, through um, donations. So that's part of it. Um, 2019, our latest sort of uh, public campaign was really a riff of a walk rally. Uh, which I heard about in a conference that I was attending. And so we did a campaign trying to show people how, how short the distances of actually walking downtown in, in our city would be. And it was kind of a guerrilla campaign in the sense that we put these signs up. Um, it took the city a while to realize that it wasn't them who did it. And uh, sure enough, after several months, we got this amazing email from the public works at the city of Winnipeg wanting to um, wanting to make the signs permanent. So success story there. Um, like many other architecture firms, we also engage in teaching. I won't say more about that, but I think uh, we've been fortunate enough to be invited to a few other universities in addition to our own, where we've been teaching for a long time. And we've always tried to go out to the public to present students' work so that they get exposure to how to sort of talk to real people out there on the street. This is from the Forks where we followed a project that they're actually doing. Last year we were, um, we were um, teaching at the IIT, College of Architecture in Chicago. And as, a, as part of that program, um, asked the students also to create performance for their, for their project so that they would have to have make a financial case for everything that they did to try to prepare them for, for life in that way. And, and here's some of the details that they also had to engage in another course um, along with studio. And I think what's important in my segue here is this, just that we also made sure that all of our group here at the office would come to Chicago for about two weeks time. Uh, so there was a rotating uh, list of attendees and they all got to teach or be TAs as part of that course and get exposure and actually working at the, at the famed Crown Hall um, during that time. So it was sort of a team building exercise at the same time. Uh, towards the end of that term, uh, we, uh, we had a symposium called Platform Middle, invited a bunch of our colleagues to talk about housing for the 99% and it's spawning a book. Q Taylor, if you're out there, I need to hear back from you. I saw your name flash by, so please give me a call. That's one of our people who's currently at the GSD uh, doing his master's but working on a book publication that's coming out of that. Anyway, um, so Collaboration, that's my final topic. It exists not only across this table, but also in terms of having the Architecture Foundation here with us um, as a storefront, um, uh, housing people and collaborators when we need them. So yeah, from Design Quarter, Winnipeg, temporarily we have storefront uh, when they went through um, uh, a change due to Dave Penner, our good colleague's uh, death recently. Um, and sometimes we lend the desk to our developers or researchers and, and so forth. And then finally, to, um, to a current project and to sort of the exotic Winnipeg for hopefully for those of you out there in the world, um, we do, um, we started uh, something called the Warming Huts. Um, you mean who started? Peter Hargis. Sorry, started with participating with Peter Hargis. It says right there. I'm not yeah. trying to steal his thunder. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, so we're part of uh, part of the initial discussion in 2010 when Peter went to see Paul. Sounds very biblical. But Paul <laughs> Jordan was um, the CEO at the time of the Forks North Portage Partnership, which is a public, public entity in the, in the center of those confluence, those two rivers. And Peter proposed to Paul that we should have warming shacks along the skating trail, which is actually Guinness World Book's longest skating trail, like 12 kilometers one year. Um, and you can see me skate through here as we're going through. Please put those slides. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. sorry. And so um, the original year, uh, there were five firms, including Peter's and ours, who did warming huts. Ours wasn't terribly warm, but it was this giant orb hanging from the bridge which we skinned with the sort of construction fabric and then collaborated with Eva Tarsha, who's a local artist, to have this sort of neon orange paint on it. Um, and so um, after that first year, then Peter uh, developed it into a competition. And so now every year he invites, you know, a bunch of people from around the world. So there's usually about 200, uh, 200 uh, participants in this competition to invent a new shack. And, um, and now we're moving on to 
this year, what we did two things on the river. Um, we did something called um, Windsock, which is uh, 2020 construction flags uh, along the riverbed in a sort of a shape of a windsock. And secondly, um, a sunspot uh, 2.0, which is the new kind of uh, counterpart to our original orb, uh, sunk in sort of a pit where Colin is here freezing it. Um, and uh, and will be sort of landscape art um, along the way where kids can climb into it. It's gonna be a giant ice bowl, hopefully a lot of fun. And so you can see the counterpart there and um, that's it for my part. So all those things together, hopefully will validate what we do. In our <laughs> you didn't leave me any time. Any. <laughs> I'll speed this up, but this was okay. interesting because I think, I think it sort of gives a different dimension to architecture work. A lot of firms do work that's outside of the, uh, the construction. So I'll try to be rather brief. What we decided to, in order to, to help sort of situating this entire exercise into the, uh, in, in Winnipeg, we decided to show you five projects that happen to be on the same, happen to be on the same road or the same, uh, same um, street in Winnipeg. And uh, they're about one mile apart. And uh, they've been, they've We've been on working on them in last uh, for last ten years. So going starting from the first one, I'll just go very quickly through it. Um, at the time, the district was the red light district, and the uh, it was sort of a tricky proposition. And the uh, our hopes was was to create homes for people in, in an area that was rather um, rather challenging for that. So the uh, the idea of of uh, creating individual homes rather than a building was one that sort of led to the development as you're seeing it here. But it really rests on layering of public spaces and layering of connections between people. So the, the first layer itself is a raised platform that connects all the individual condominiums um, that shelters parking underneath it um, and also provides connection all the front doors open onto it and provides connection between the residents. Above that are the dwellings and on top of the dwellings are the rooftop um, patios, which in summary creates a very interesting um, dynamic between all the uh, occupants between them. Um, different roofs. The interiors, while well, the exterior is rather, uh, rather plain, if you wish, rather straightforward, the interiors are based on the idea of a living wrap and the continuous ribbon of living that kind of expresses itself as probably the most radical living arrangement we've, uh, we've created within a, um, within a suite, within a dwelling. However, it does generate uh, rather astounding views, if you wish, and, and interesting living environments that, that suit um, everybody from, from a single people to families. The uh, right above it, the same developers sort of had a chance to acquire a piece of land right, right behind it, a piece of land that had literally no street frontage. It was bound by the uh, a variety of sort of backyard conditions and highways and so on. And the, uh, we told them that the only way to, to get value out of the site would be to raise the building off the, uh, off the ground in order to garner views. We hired a um, scissor lift to get it get get some pictures up there and this is sort of the views from the scissor lift generated and after that it was just a matter of question how do you construct this that actually uh, meets the market demands and through that Ken was the one who discovered actually that the round geometry has given us most efficiency and then reduced the amount of envelope for uh, for the, the same number of suites by about 30 percent and from there we employed every um, construction technique known to men uh, trying to and women I guess trying to trying to get this thing on budget so the, it, um, it really is, and, and you know, kudos to, our, uh, to the contractors, it really is a two-story building on stilts. So once we built the stilts, it became just a regular two-story building and that's how it was constructed. So the real- um, You can ask the builder if that's true, <laughs> uh, but that's what we tell people. Two story, right. The world's tallest two-story building. <laughs> One of the things that we try to fight and that we try to, try to fight for, if you wish, is, is a smart design and ergonomic design rather than size. And you know, our research discovered the staggering statistic that in the last 50 years, we've uh, increased our living space from around 200, 300 square feet to 900 square feet per person. And the, uh, as such, we're trying to find, always find ways to, uh, to, to provide living quarters for people for less, uh, for in less space, but try to, to uh, create spaces um, within, um, that are actually functionally, um, functioning like a bigger space. So this is sort of a 600 square feet square feet unit with Murphy beds and, and devices of that kind lives like 900, at least in our minds and in theory. And that's sort of what, it, what it looks like. Ken actually lives in one of those. <laughs> so he's 
with his uh, young daughter and, and, uh, and, a, and a partner. And then there are two types of units that you're seeing here in this building. Obviously, they are uh, pie-shaped as, uh, as geometry has resulted in. And what's interesting about it, we're able to keep all the utilities in small spaces on the, on the narrow end without windows. However, the, uh, the, uh, all the living spaces are close to about 20 feet of window on the, uh, on the opposite end. And the, uh, this particular uh, unit or unit type has is sort of a Swiss knife configuration where all the uh, amenities in the space are housed within the or services in the space are housed within this wall on the side and everything else is an open space with a tub in the middle. So the um, Johanna mentioned already um, the um, the project itself is uh, 40 units um, and the around the uh, around the round um, corridor as you can see here. Uh, what, what the, one of the most interesting things about the project it was tendered during the time that uh, Amer Canadian dollar was stronger than American dollar. That lasted for about six months. Regardless, uh, by the time we got to build this thing, every, every material that we specified that came through, through the United States was uh, outside of affordable. So uh, everything had to be pared down and we think it actually pared down for the better and we learned a tremendous amount of um, from that, and uh, it, you know, it made us made our designs most more robust. The fancy meshes were replaced with chain link fence. The shiny soffits replaced with with uh, prefabricated metal shingles. The uh, you know the, the shiny cladding replaced with the uh, with curtain and so on. But actually allowed us to sort of rethink the way the project works in its context. Context how um, its robustness is actually uh, really suitable for the uh, for the fringe of the city and the. Uh, and we think that actually the outcome was uh, worked out better than what we what we imagined or designed initially. So Johanna mentioned already the building on the or the little unit on the top uh, that resulted uh, from some fees that were owed to us, and the uh, well, I didn't mention and that, we're able to <laughs> we were able to to secure a piece of land on top of the elevator core. Asked our engineers the building was already under construction, but we asked our engineers whether we could actually house a. Um, I put a little building on top and sure enough, there was enough strength in the foundation to do so. And so the, uh, the little place on top is an open invitation to, um, I should say everybody on this call, if you ever come <laughs> to Winnipeg, um, the, uh, please uh, contact us and we can, um, we can certainly let you um, stay with us. This is a space we use for us artists in residence. We use it as an Airbnb when it's not booked by our friends and family. Which pays for it so being on. free to those who need <laughs> it. Strangely, strangely, it looks really simple on the screen right now, but no pro no project smaller than that has ever had more <laughs> extra solutions from a building code perspective than that. I need to just keep on going, guys. Yeah. The pump house, the, uh, the, the historic pump house building further down the road was slated for demolition after 17 years of, of failed attempts of, of resurrection. And uh, we, we sort of tasked ourselves without a client figure out a way to save it. We've sort of developed a pro forma that included two adjacent pieces of land and um, improved to ourselves that financially the, uh, uh, the building works and the, or the project would work. And then approached one of our clients and the city who owns the building and then said, here's the project, here's how it works. Why don't you take it on as such? All we want for that is to be architects. And sure enough, it took about two years to negotiate a deal but the, uh, we, got to, uh, we got to work on the project. It's rather a complex project, which the presentation sort of reflects. So I'll go try to go very quickly through it. The, uh, the, the existing heritage building, if you wish, has a great pump hole on the ground floor, which doesn't allow any construction inside really at that level. Um, the, uh, the two residential buildings that flank it are accessed from either side through the pump house. And so therefore uh, providing the uh, experience to people and connection to the, to the heritage building. And then the, we were able to figure out a way to suspend another floor within the, uh, within the heritage building and provide commercial entrances or commercial entities space on, our, on either end. So the inside the, uh, the new office space is um, suspended just below the, uh, the roof trusses, uh, creating a, um, a, you'll see a rather unique uh, work environment for the, uh, for an advertising agency that just that basically, basically took it on the moment they, um, they, uh, they saw the quality of the space. So the, um, the space in itself is purely um, purely uh, built or was purely constructed for to house the pumps, uh, to pump the um, water from the river to the uh, sprinkler system in the city. And it uh, was never used as such, um, fortunately, and then it was decommissioned in the 90s. 
And the, uh, but the, it did create a place that was difficult to build in. We discovered that we could actually suspend the floor within the existing structure, therefore making it rather, rather affordable. You can see here on the pictures, worked with a, with a client who um, hired daily labor uh, to construct this project. So we actually pared it down to uh, pieces that he can buy at the local Home Depot. Uh, it's, it's the entire space is constructed literally out of three elements, which are the steel studs painted painted on site by painstakingly painted on site by <laughs> by a roller by one of these uh, daily laborers and the uh, and the fiber board that's used for the walls and the uh, and quarter inch glass that don't require any specialty um, installation uh, techniques so anyway the space does the construction technique here really echoes what we've learned in the uh, in the previous project which is how to pare it down to 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 the most robust of the elements that would save the uh, that, that not only cost less, but actually are buildable by unskilled labor. Here, so the two other buildings, two buildings that flank the historic building housed from public space underneath them. They're based on open air corridors, which is rather unique for Winnipeg, if you wish, but it, uh, it does sort of provide a connection. The project. That's right, but it, <laughs> we do it all the time, apparently. But the, uh, it does provide a connection to the city by, from the and, and between the uh, and between the residents. It's one of the things that we try to do uh, which is try to connect our buildings with with the city and try to connect the uh, our, our uh, the city uh, with with our projects. And we don't think of buildings as 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 sort of objects, but we think of them as sort of subjects in the city. Um, the um, I'm going to skip over this quickly. This is the um, the building. The first building has been um, almost completed. Um, it does take inspiration from the robust industrial aesthetic of the interior of the of the historic pump house from the mill deck um, structure and construction that uh, many of you are likely familiar with, uh, but basically nailed together two by sixes to create a structural floor and the uh, fire fire escapes that are abundant in the area uh, where the building is. And so the, uh, you know, through a lot of architectural prototyping, <laughs> excuse me, and so on, we were able to generate the interiors out of that structural system that by virtue of the structural system had the, the warmth afforded by wood that would otherwise not be there um, or is not there in the uh, in the uh, standard contemporary construction. The building is um, flanked again by the, uh, the two exit staircases connecting by exterior hallways, uh, providing um, cross ventilation to all the suites. So all the suites have ability to have windows facing two ways, which is super um, rare in North American context. Where the um, where the corridor and two stairwells always block that uh, that cross ventilation. So the through a, a bunch of code shenanigans, we were able to um, to get that approved, and now we're using a couple other buildings because the uh, the uh, the advantages of that are obviously obviously great. Um, the from there, I'll just skip quickly to a project that's under construction. It just broke construction. Um, there are sort of two blocks over, and it's on a very quaint and yet rather beautiful street um, in the city. The building that says Great West Metal on it is part of the project and where, that's where the project starts. And the, the rest sure. is really historic building. The rest is really wrapping around it and creating public space, which is sort of part of the part of our mandate is to create and give space back to the city as a, as a place um, to connect the city to our, to our buildings and to our projects. And then the, um, uh, you can see here how the new building wraps around it again, freeing the uh, the public space at grade and connecting the heritage building to the um, to the um, to the rest of the site. Uh, interestingly enough, the heritage building is four sided, so it has windows on all four sides, which makes it rather uniquely suitable for conversion into into uh, residential. But what we've discovered inside the building is about 100 years of history that has been untouched. Yeah, anything from from flood and leaky roofs to little fires. Uh, to all the materials that were original to the building and so on. So our approach to the uh, to design of the project interior of the heritage building itself was to try to preserve as much of that in the same way we've done it in the pump house and build new in a rather minimal way. And so the uh, the new building, as I mentioned, flanks and never touches um, the original building, except for this instance where we have a rather lightweight exit stereo that uh, that connects the two buildings, but it creates a variety of exterior spaces and and um, options for um, for gathering. Now, the, I'm not going to get into much detail here because I'm taking too much time, um, uh, obviously. But these are sort of the projects um, 
become a part of Project Ease. And lastly, uh, we've been working with the Forks North Part Portage Partnership on a, on a redevelopment of 11 acre site into a into a new um, 1,000 square sorry 1,000 unit 1 million square foot um, concept plan if you wish or a master plan. It's a because largest it's largest um, empty parking lot or surface parking lot in the city. We're working with um, Brent Bellamy of Number 10 and um, and Scott Lake Miller Murray, the landscape architects for the project. And what we inherited from the previous administration was this idea that is super common in, in, in Canada, Canadian cities, which is the towers on a podium and uh, four of them were planned for the site. And we, we thought for a variety of reasons um, in Winnipeg, there are only probably two or three developers that could take one of these towers on. There's probably two or three contractors only that could take these towers on. And the uh, while there's, there's a burgeoning um, community of, of um, both developers and contractors that built in a, in a sort of mid or missing middle scale. So we've decided uh, in, in, in sort of re reconfigure the project and rediscovered that the, the same density could be achieved in a village of six story, uh, six story buildings uh, that would enable us to not only um, break these buildings apart, but have them sort of built by a variety of architects and variety of builders and a variety of developers. And not only that, we would actually be able to, to distribute programs in a much more uh, democratic and distributed way that, that actually contributes to building of the city. And that had a variety of other advantages. Um, after we reduced the size of the city block to the building and demanded that every building be 360 degrees, therefore contributing to the public space, we've learned how to orient the buildings in a way that create uh, protected environments and create small microclimates, places that are rather um, protected in the uh, while we're allowing uh, full vehicular transport through the, uh, through the space, we are actually prioritizing pedestrians to, through scale and, and texture. And the keeping buildings down to six stories um, permits a multi-sensory um, sort of connection. So everything that we learned from the buildings that we showed you um, earlier uh, and the buildings that we actually cut our teeth on, we applied to this master plan. The client is amazing and as such, they, they're taking curator, curatorial role over the, um, the ground floor. They've um, accepted our, our sort of target of narrow storage or sort of storefronts in order to um, animate the, the public realm. Uh, there's a lot of, again, advantages of the, uh, to the arrangement and our experience in housing has allowed us to prove that every, every one of these building sites is actually financially viable. And lastly, we're mandating a post and beam construction in order to allow for the future reconfiguration. So the space itself uh, or the place itself has been um, opened up for development proposals. We are we currently have 11 um, developers, 11 separate projects that have been um, sort of spoken for and that there's letters of intent um, that, that are signed and we're starting, uh, hopefully starting construction this year. On those, there's seven or eight architects that are involved in the, the entire project does revolve around the public space, which is actually going to be um, managed by the forks. And that's it. From you forgot to mention like an important line. I did. So this street, by the way, is the um, we're, we're vouching to be renamed as a inter Ken Borton way. And this is Ken Borton, who has been a project architect on every one of the projects on the street by coincidence <laughs> and lives in, in, in one of them or two. And was the first person yeah. actually that joined us. Um, I forgot to mention that in the beginning, <laughs> three weeks after our conception. So, all right. Sorry, uh, Aaron. I hope we left you. All much right. Time. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, it's amazing that a firm this new and small can do so much work. It's uh, quite impressive. Um, I have two sets of questions for you. One, a very sort of ideological one um in in old-fashioned sense and one a uh, more sort of formal one which one would you like first you choose <laughs> all right let's start with ideology so i'm i'm sort of confused by your mixture of uh uh you know marxist idealism and <laughs> and capitalist in entrepreneurship um there, uh, though it seems somewhat familiar to me from my from my Dutch background, I was hoping that you could explain a little bit uh, what you see as your position in the economic structures in which you work. Are you trying to 
uh, ameliorate the differences in uh, income distribution and resource distribution? Are you trying to do that by design or by the way you operate or both? Uh, do you see yourself as in your work itself criticizing those economic and social conditions? Or do you see yourself, uh, Joanna, as a former chair of the Chamber of Commerce, as actually uh, being a part of that system and trying to reform it from the inside out? Well, that's, I mean, obviously you would pick up on that. Um, I almost <laughs> did, uh, did say that uh, we're sort of operating within the capitalist system to be communists uh, in a way, um, or socialist at, at least. And- Guerrilla communists, is that? Well, <laughs> we, that's the ongoing joke anyway. Uh, you know, Sasha comes from, a, from the communist background here and I'm definitely from a social democratic uh, sort of uh, stage before. And I think there is some, you know, as we're laughing at it, some truth to that, that in a sense that I think we've always thought that we have some sort of embedded uh, social responsibility to the world. And, and yet, in order to be able to kind of be or do a little bit of the Robin Hood stuff along the way, then we have to work within that in that system to do so. So I'm not sure that we as a sort of a 20 person office can change the system, uh, but it's trying to operate within to, to try to create more, more equitable or accessible places for, for a bigger portion of the population. And I think that's the topic of, of that research piece that we're doing with, with uh, or for the IIT is trying to figure out how does the, how does social housing actually get to exist in, in this North American uh, market driven kind of economy. So that's, that's, that's a, a big question for us. But and, and at the same time, you know, when it comes to the office culture, it's very much, you know, if we do well, everybody here hopefully does well. And that's something that we, we believe in and, and we hope that we can perpetuate. Look at that camera. Oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> I should look up there, not my own camera. <laughs> but, and just as a follow-up uh, to that, um, when you do design housing, uh, it seems as if the urban context and the collective form comes first. And uh, what was already implicit in your critique of the amount of square feet or square meters that we now all command was that the actual individual spaces and their qualities, a pie-shaped apartment, seem to be secondary to those concerns, or am I misreading that? Hmm. I'm trying to, to sort of imagine the question or place the question. I, I hope like if we read it as the interiors or the, the, the end user is less important than how the building situates itself in its context, we would hope that wouldn't be the case, but that it's, that it's both and not either or, um, certainly, but, but it is both and, and, and therefore you end up with, with uh, making compromises and making choices for sure between, between the two and which one takes priority in which, in which scenario. But I think um, like those pie-shaped units in particular, while they're smaller and, and, and and, and stranger maybe than their market-driven counterparts. Uh, we would argue and, and sort of it's proven out that there's more or as much usability in that little bit of square footage than, than there is in something that's much larger and less thoughtful. So- I, I can't help myself, Paul, to add is that when we compare North American housing, multifamily housing, uh, complexes to the, the sort of their European or North European counterparts. I think the vast difference though is the public space is that there is a collective space uh, always as part of a kids play there and it enables actually families to, to live in multifamily housing in a different way than, than anybody here in Winnipeg or across the prairies anyway. I don't know about New York or the coast where living quarters are generally smaller, but anyway, we believe that that's sustainable or, or you know, it's possible to age in place. Um, it, the difference is that social space. And so I grew up, you know, playing ball or, you know, at the sandbox uh, among apartment building complexes, same with Sasha. And so that's not how 
embedded in the way that we, we've always approached housing and thought about it, um, but hopefully not at the cost of the space inside. Well, just I'll, 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 one more and I'll drop this, uh, this aspect, but uh, it seems that um, you're very deferential to those kind of urban conditions uh, or found conditions, the way you genuflect to the um, existing building that you surround with uh, uh, housing in the last project you showed, or the way that the pump house um, produces a floor of offices, but it's kind of up there in the attic with the, with the grandeur of the industrial equipment below that, but also the way that the form uh, of the, um, uh, sorry, the satellite uh, yep. Yep. Uh, building um, is so prominent and also it was designed about the views out, not necessarily about how you experience uh, the space itself. So, uh, and, and finally, the, the most expressive work that you've done is, is in these design, the design of public spaces. It, it seems all the more interesting to me because when I think of Winnipeg, uh, be, and again, forgive my biases, uh, because of the climate, uh, I don't think of it as a great place where one celebrates public space. Yep. There's a, there's a, that's been a long-standing position sort of in Winnipeg that we don't, uh, uh, you know, it, we're afraid to go outside. We're afraid about our, our public space. We're afraid of our weather. We're, we're sort of timid or ashamed of it. And, and it is definitely uh, something that we're after, right? To, mm -hmm. to attack that and to, to change that, that narrative that, um, that it, we can live outside, we can, uh, have great public space. Uh, right. It's you know, it's two months of the year that that it gets really cold. Sure, when it's really cold, don't go outside. <laughs> but uh, but there's there's 10, 11 months of the year where it's perfectly acceptable. Our river trail, um, we were down there on Sunday, and there there was thousands of people skating by, engaging with this public art installation and. Which and wasn't there ten years ago. Ten years ago, there was there was no one outside. Like it was, we were afraid to go outside. It was we live in this cold climate, and yet we're afraid of it or something. And I think that that's changing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> let me ask a, a, a the more formal question. And while I'm doing that, I will uh, remind the audience that I am uh, hopeful that there will be questions from all of you. I don't see anything popping up yet on the chat room. So I sure do hope that people have questions uh, that they wanna funnel through uh, the chat function here. Um, the formal question is this, I was trying to figure out what brings your work together. Uh, another critic uh, compared your work to that of Herzog Dumeril, who of course are famous for doing radically different types of buildings in different situations. Um, but I, I do notice that you have a fondness uh, for modules and for non-hierarchical uh, building forms that you build up either from prefab mass-produced elements or that you just build up in geometric uh, modules. There seems to be less interest in a hierarchy of forms in making the big gesture um, in trying to fuse things together into a single form. And there seems to be more interest in building up holes out of uh, modular and interlocking parts. Is that correct? I think that's correct. And you, you know, we often say that every one of our buildings can, can be sort of purchased at Home Depot. Uh, in pieces, it's just a matter of how you assemble them together. Uh, so the, I, th I think it's it's the nature of construction industry where we are, and it's a nature of, of who we are as people that, that that we sort of gravitate to to architecture that that should be should be constructible or maybe understood or legible if you wish. And the uh, you know plywood comes straight, and sure, it's so much fun to bend it and and put it around a variety and, and you know do variety of things with it with it 
but at, say, at the same time, when you use it in a straight form, it, create, it can create space rather, rather, rather efficient. And so the, even when we delve onto the, uh, onto the thoughts and, and you know, through the design process into the, uh, the form making, if you wish, that's less hierarchical, or sorry, that's not hierarchical and so on, or hierarchical actually, as, as, as you put it, the, uh, we often ask ourselves if, we're, if we could not create the same quality of space through, through more uh, straightforward means. And that becomes sort of a test each time for us. And the, you know, the, the four of us and, and the rest of the crew often put our work through the, uh, through the ringer of that question is, is you know, doing something in a more complicated way going to create a better environment, going to create a more interesting uh, space or not? And that, you know, rarely, rarely. Can we afford less space to give back to the end user if we right. try to- Rarely is the answer, well, we could not do it um, through, through the more straightforward ways, right? And so the, is that design, I guess, it, one way to think about it would be to think about it as design, as you're editing, and you're trying to, to uh, create something uh, using the minimal means, if you wish. I think that there, there's something, there, there's a certain level of responsibility that's sort of fairly bred, even though Yohan and I are not local. Ken and Colin can well, talk to that. Local. We're local now. <laughs> there's certainly we're something local. that's rather fairly uh, fairly bred from, from that perspective. We, we could speak of it conceptually, but it also is like 95% of our work is has to be understood, consumed, and built by the market. And if if you're if you're outside of that in too many ways, uh, it, it, it's it's going to fall apart. I, th I think that would be the, one of the simpler ways of saying it, right? Yeah, or well, take 62M, like um, with, you know, Ken's project there, um, that is round, but it is actually not, of course, it's faceted and, and there's, you know, visual trickery to try to make it <laughs> appear less clumsy that way. Um, <laughs> And so uh, it's it's really trying to be rudimentary and, and ensure that less gets cut along the way in the process. Yeah, we always know that our developers and owners and builders that are on the project that you know at any moment they can cut any detail or change anything on us uh, because often there's not a tendered project to begin with and they just kind of go as we as they they work as they go and if they find a better deal on something they'll cut it and we have to be able to. You know, know that our details and our materials can actually survive that, right? So if, if something if something is very cuttable, then and it's a hinge point on the project, we, we shouldn't do it because we need to be able to be uh, able to withstand that kind of uh, scrutiny, scrutiny and, and rigor and so forth. Yeah. So it's it's again a combination of the uh, ideological and practical, uh, like. Yeah. And this the scrutiny of, of owners and clients and and, and builders, it. Sometimes we, we put those as an antagonistic or, or in opposition to architecture. And I think we, by necessity, but also by ideology, really embraced that scrutiny and said, if it can't withstand that, then, then maybe it's not good enough. Maybe it needs to uh, be changed or, or be different in some way. When I, uh, when I, started uh, this introduction, I talked about the kind of norm core aspects of this. Uh, I have to say, seeing the work more fully, I'm not sure if, I, uh, if, I'll, if I'll stick with that. But there is this, this interest in using those modules and that, that combination of we're building for the people and we need to get things built efficiently and economically. Uh, there seems to be an impulse behind there towards making a kind of new modern vernacular, a kind of uh, what I've in other deep uh, uh, contexts called a Home Depot modernism. Um, even though we, just so you know, Home Depot is ideologically suspect these days because of the- yes, I mean, you know, Rona, but the, uh, you would, most of the American audience or United States audience would know what we're talking about, <laughs> which is our- so, so is there, is there, dare, and I know architects hate when I ask this, but is there a kind of style aspect to this? Does it come together in a mode of making that presents itself in a certain way? I would suggest no. And the reason I would suggest no, is, well, sorry, and then it's likely gonna go into a yes, is, <laughs> the, uh, is the, 
is the uh, there is a uh, on every one of our projects there there is a fair bit of customization of of the of the ordinary and the either through appropriation and use a different in a different way from what it was intended for or through a through a novel way and, and through research and development that we that we do in the office like the, the office is full of, of mock-ups of walls and so on and the um and so from that perspective the 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 i think if there's a style that maybe it's an attitude towards a assembly rather than it is in in uh in chasing some some sort of appearance, right? The uh, or some sort of stylistic effort. Like there's there's a part of this presentation that talks about material, which we didn't include. Uh, that 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 says because of the immigration in Winnipeg, we have very few trades who can do concrete well because the uh, we didn't get the Italian or Portuguese or Spanish immigrants in Winnipeg. We got Ukrainian and German who can actually frame wood and put stucco on them and maybe put some metal flashing around it and that's sort of the nature of the built environment on one side and nature of the traits that are readily available and if not readily available than the ones that are that are most economical and sure it's sure you can build concrete buildings but they come with the premium and so on and so the we're tapping into that context and i think it's our responsibility to tap, tap into that context and then work within those parameters and there's you know if you accept that and that's one of the things that we have accepted over the years if you accept that and there's a there's a plethora of opportunities for innovation and doing things that are outside of ordinary right so you're starting from rather rudimentary set of uh, set of parameters and that's what that's what we are really interested in and so how can we reconfigure the ordinary into something that's not all right um I uh, do not see any questions arising in the chat box. Uh, there is, however, a suggestion about a suggestion that we invite perhaps some of the uh, Canadian uh, uh, auditors here who are listening in uh, to uh, chime in and to uh, provide their perspective on whether we are uh, interpreting the work or whether the work is being presented in uh, in a productive manner. Interesting. <laughs> Local fact checkers. <laughs> I'm not sure they're out there. Yeah. We we do have a few, but maybe they're too shy to say anything, or they're too Canadian nice. <laughs> I'm just full of cliches tonight. <laughs> <laughs> They might be, hopefully we didn't put them off by anything that we said. Mm -hmm. Oh, like we would just. <laughs> and I would, I would say to everybody, please feel free to turn on your cameras um, and we'll give it a, a couple more minutes to see if there's some questions and um, and otherwise it's it's moving in on 7.15 and, and we can um, see if there are any concluding remarks that anyone would like to. I, I will ask one more softball question, maybe as a way to also uh, give people some time to understand they really have to ask some questions. Uh, you're working in Calgary now and, and mentioned other places as well. Uh, of course, the softball question is how is that changing uh, your work, both in terms of uh, completely different or somewhat different context uh, and in terms of working uh, remotely rather than in a community and for a community that you are uh, in which you are so embedded. Mm -hmm. It's certainly challenging to try to understand what the response, you know, what the local response to local would be or should be. Um, we, we're often sought for the work that we've done in Winnipeg and the uh, maybe for robustness of it and, and whatever else we brought into the uh, into the discussion. So the but certainly we're not pretending that we understand any other city as well as we do understand Winnipeg. However, the uh, we try to um, understand what we're doing and where we're doing it. So the uh, well, and we have collaborators. Yeah, we certainly have collaborators. So the uh, in, in, in all of those cities and clients who are tapped into the culture, and we, we seek for uh, we seek to to understand the culture, the milieu, the uh, the locale, the uh, peculiarities of every every site uh, through through any 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 um, you know tool that's available to to every other architect. 
So how's it going? It's going fine. It's going. Uh, it's going well. But we're not. We're not strained from the lessons learned. I think that's the that that is the key. We're not trying to updo ourselves or or to, to 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 change the way we approach architecture. And I think that's you know, Aaron. Like it's interesting. We are we've been invited to speak at many places. And we think mostly because we come out of a place that people don't understand. Um, the uh, and that, that, you know to say Winnipeg is, is is exotic to the rest of the world is is not an understatement. And then once they learn how the uh, you know about the, the the dynamics of the city that bred probably the most artists or people in the art industry in, in Canada, if not North America, due to a variety of reasons, is 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 often very astounding to people. So we we hope architecture can actually um, hold its own in the same way. Uh, working with all, all of our colleagues uh, in, the, in the city and trying to, to up that uh, up our game. So that's that's the uh, that's really the hope. And you know, getting hired in other cities is sort of the, the beginning of that. And we're not the only ones. There's a lot of firms that work across across Canada and the United States that are in the day, and they're they're doing quite well. Yeah, we try to be process driven more than solution driven. So. The, the the process should travel quite well um hopefully the in terms of embedding ourselves and, and sort of pulling what's in, what's important rather than than trying to transplant solutions that worked in one place to the other it doesn't even work in the same city never mind the same country to try to take a solution from one site to the next every every site is different never mind every city being different right so Our Canadian counterparts are being quiet. Is that? Is that Looks like it, yeah. Nobody else is. I'm looking at the chat here. Okay. No questions. No questions. So I think that. Did I hear that one or? <laughs> no, it must have been. No, it must be you. Um, so I think at that. Um, We'll call it a night in that case. So I'd like to thank everyone for taking part and for taking us to points further north, um, touching on all sorts of subjects. But particularly, I think, and it'd be interesting to go back and look through the kind of engagement that's allowed you to work with the city to think through these things more cohesively, um, perhaps than the, some of the kind of urban acupuncture that we see here. Um, so yeah. thank you for sharing the practice with us. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking care of us as well.